Thomas. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very honored to be here. Thanks in particular to Professor Kanda and Professor Hertig for inviting me to be part of the program. Um, some of you know I spent a good part of my career uh, focused on Japan and Japanese corporate governance. Um, in recent years, uh, I've gotten interested in uh, China, uh, I think a very important and understudied uh, area of, uh, of corporate governance. And so I'm going to talk today about uh, some of the distinctive features of Chinese firms um, that are a result of very distinctive institutional environment in which these firms have developed, um, an environment that we typically today call uh, state capitalism. Uh, and what I want to do is describe those uh, features and then highlight uh, some of the, I think, quite important legal and policy issues that are raised by um, the uh, global economic activity of Chinese, uh, Chinese firms. My basic argument is that, and I don't think it's particularly controversial, is that uh, many legal regimes in the United States, but also internationally, um, were developed without Chinese firms in mind. And so there's a tension uh, between these uh, 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 distinctive characteristics of the firms and the legal regimes that uh, have uh, developed around them. And so we'll have to see how this tension gets resolved. My presentation today is really a collection, or based on a collection of research that I've done, some of which with uh, co-authors Li Wen Lin of the uh, University of British Columbia and Wen Tong Chung of, uh, uh, of the University of uh, Florida. Uh, one of the interesting developments of the last decade in the global economy is the rise of Chinese firms as uh, very large, globally active uh, actors. And you see the chart here. This is Global Fortune 500, the number of firms. You see that uh, China has eclipsed Japan in 2012, about the same time that China eclipsed Japan as the world's second largest economy. And if the trend continues uh, in a few years' time, China will have the largest number of Fortune uh, 500 companies in, in the world, about two-thirds of these Fortune 500 Chinese companies are state-owned uh, enterprises. And so what I want to do is to start by looking at uh, the distinctive characteristics of Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, one way to get into this topic um, is to try to relate um, this to the varieties of capitalism literature. Those of you who are involved in corporate governance studies know that about 15 years ago, it's a prominent line of research trying to categorize uh, companies, countries rather, according to the style of capitalism that they have. Uh, uh, Shareholder-oriented capitalism, or what the variety of, of uh, capitalism literature calls uh, LMEs, liberal market economies. So a typical example would be the United States or, uh, or the UK, where short shareholder wealth is prominent. The primary goal of corporations is to maximize shareholder wealth. Um, in contrast to that, or what this literature called a CME, or coordinated market economy, Japan would be a prime example of a coordinated market economy. Less emphasis on shareholder returns, more emphasis on employee welfare and other stakeholders uh, in the enterprise. So to this dichotomy, I think we can now add what I'm calling um, a, a state-oriented economy, or SOE. Um, this is an economy in which um, state-owned actors are clearly not the only actors, but they're prominent actors and their um, uh, uh, central place in the economy has had a deep effect on institutional development. And I think China is a primary example of a uh, state-oriented uh, state economy. So let's look at um, what does shareholder capitalism look like in, uh, in China, at least in the state sector. So at the top, um, in, these are some of the distinctive characteristics. So there is an agency known as SASAC, the State-Owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission. Um, it is a unit of the government right below the state council, which acts as a holding company holding the shares in the 100 or so um, large central state-owned enterprises in China on behalf of the state council, and therefore, at least theoretically, on behalf of the Chinese people. So SASAC appoints uh, and dismisses the managers uh, of the top managers of these firms. It regulates their compensation, and it uh, plays a supervisory role with respect, to, uh, with respect to these firms. So each of these dots is a centrally owned uh, uh, state-owned enterprise in the Chinese system. Let's look at, um, so at least in theory, this makes SASAC the world's largest controlling shareholder by, uh, by assets. Let's take a look at what, what one of these dots looks like. So here's China Datang. It's a major energy producer in China. You see it's um, recently, in 2015, it's 392 in the global Fortune 500. So it's a very large company. 
It has, as all of these companies do, a core company or a holding company at the top. The shares of that holding company or the share of that holding company is owned by, by SASAC. It's structured as a limited liability company with special provision under China's corporate code uh, governing it. And it has, as you see, three publicly traded corporations, some of which are listed in Hong Kong and, uh, and London. Now, typically in the corporate governance literature, if you're focusing on these companies, you would stop here. You would ask, do they have independent directors? Are they cross-listed? Uh, and, and so on. But I want to give you an idea of why that would be very misleading, and it wouldn't give you a complete picture of, um, uh, of this enterprise. So here is the corporate, the entire corporate structure of the Datang Group. You see that there's much more beyond the publicly uh, traded companies. There is a finance company in the middle um, here, which engages in intra-company uh, uh, financial uh, transactions. And you see massive numbers of downstream subsidiaries with ownership, with uh, almost exclusively top-down ownership uh, from the core company on down. Now, some of you may, looking at this chart, may be reminded of a Japanese keiretsu. At least visually, it looks quite similar to a keiretsu, but there's some big differences here. But in fact, um, this resemblance is not entirely uh, coincidental. So the Chinese economic reformers in the 1990s were very fascinated by Japan. Japan's economy was booming at the time. It's a neighboring East Asian uh, country, and so quite naturally, they looked to Japan as a model. But this is not the Keiretsu system for a number of reasons. First of all, as I mentioned, all of the shareholding here is top down. There is no true uh, cross ownership uh, in this model. Why would you need cross ownership in a model in which the state is the controlling shareholder? Cross ownership would simply complicate um, the, 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 control, the control structure. Secondly, the finance company is not really like a main bank in the Japanese system. First of all, because it only engages in intra company uh, financial transactions, unlike a main bank, which has uh, uh, transactions throughout uh, the group and indeed outside of the corporate group, um, uh, group as well. Now, this still only gives us a partial picture of the group because we have to take account of the links between this group and other, uh, other groups. So the pink circled uh, uh, companies in this chart are the core company, the parent companies of other centrally owned state-owned enterprises in the um, energy production sector in China. So again, just visually, you see the way these groups are interlinked among themselves through equity ownership. There are also joint ventures and other forms of cooperation uh, with these groups. If I had a bigger screen, I could also show the linkages between the central state-owned enterprises and the provincial or local um, state-owned enterprises, which are also uh, extensive. Okay, so um, first point is this, this is a massive, massive structure. Um, again, each one of these dots on this chart looks something, whoops, I'm going the wrong way, I'm sorry, looks something like this, okay? So you get some idea of the magnitude uh, of this operation. Um, here's an abstraction of what I just showed you um, with the state council, SASAC, owning 100% of the holding company, owning a majority or some significant percentage of the other companies in the group, some major subsidiaries which are listed. This is the public face of Chinese state-owned enterprises in the global economy, finance company, and then you have linkages to non-economic actors as well, research institutes, universities, and the like, and the linkages with other groups, um, whether they're national or provincial. The other part that this chart shows, which is very important, is the left hand, this arrow on the left hand um, side, which shows the party influence. So one of the key distinguishing characteristics of Chinese corporate governance is the parallel system, a corporate system, which is recognizable to all of us, with boards of directors and shareholders meetings and the like, and a party system. So every corporation in China has a party committee. Uh, and within this system, SASAC has a party committee, and each of the companies throughout this hierarchy has a party committee. What does the party committee do? It's involved in senior management uh, appointments and turnovers, uh, compensation matters, and it also performs a supervisory function. So this is a rough analogy to an internal control and reporting structure in a, um, in a, Western, uh, in a Western firm. I think it's this, this parallel structure that is most distinctive about Chinese firms and that raises the most policy and legal questions uh, because this is, at least as far as I'm aware, there are no other uh, country in the world, uh, perhaps North Korea or Cuba, I'm not sure, that has internal party committees embedded in the corporate, uh, in the corporate structure. 
So here is just a scheme uh, of what I've just been showing you. Uh, and we call this, we think that, uh, my co-authors and I think that one of the uh, hallmarks of Chinese state capitalism is this networking feature. So you have a hierarchical corporate structure, but it's deeply embedded in other political uh, organizations and party institutions. One thing I haven't mentioned is that the top managers in this SOE network simultaneously hold roles typically both in the government and in the party. So they'll serve in the National People's Congress or party congresses as well. So these people are wearing multiple hats, both political as well as corporate. And I think that's another key distinguishing feature of this, uh, of this system. Okay, now let me turn to um, the way that this distinctive kind of state-centered or party-centered uh, environment affects private firms as well. And I'm turning now to um, the paper that I think was distributed for, for this conference. Um, and the basic uh, argument of this paper is that ownership, equity ownership, doesn't tell us very much about a Chinese firm. Even though many legal regimes around the world, the international trade regime, uh, foreign investment regimes, um, hinge on ownership, whether it's private ownership or government ownership, in China, this line is very blurry. And it doesn't, so we can be misled by calling a firm an SOE or a POE in China. Here's an outline of the argument in that paper. First of all, this line is blurry because many firms are of mixed ownership in, uh, in China. And I'll give you an example of this in a minute. China's current SOE reforms are making this even blurrier because the, the strategy of the reform, current reform is mixed ownership. That is injecting more private capital into the state sector. Secondly, and somewhat counterintuitively, we argue that the state exercises less influence over a state-owned enterprise than might typically be assumed. But correspondingly, the state exercises more control over quote-unquote private enterprises than we would, than would, would typically be uh, assumed. And so rather than looking at ownership to determine uh, a, a, a corporation's uh, incentive structure and its behavior, we argue that you have to look at capture. That is to say, how, what is the relationship between the firm and the state in terms of personnel, in terms of subsidies, and in terms of rents that it derives from the state? That tells us much more about a Chinese firm than does ownership, we argue. So let me very briefly just um, uh, uh, play out some of these arguments. So first, here's an example of a typical ownership structure in a Chinese firm. ZTE Corporation, large, important, globally active telecommunications uh, manufacturer, was the subject of a House investigation, a uh, U.S. House investigation, uh, and its connections um, with, with the, uh, or lack of connections to the, to the Chinese military. So here's its ownership structure. It has a, an individual founder. Um, who holds a minority uh, of the firm in through uh, its own pro uh, uh, his own firm. Um, then there are two state-owned enterprises that collectively own 51% of the holding company, which is a controlling shareholder in the public corporation, ZTE Corporation. Typical example of mixed ownership in a Chinese firm. Well, is this firm a state-owned enterprise or a private enterprise? Well, maybe that's not the right question to be asking. Maybe we have to go beyond ownership to understand this firm's relationship to, um, to the state. So there's an example of, of, mixed, uh, of mixed ownership and the conundrum it causes for categorizing Chinese firms. Secondly, the point that the state actually has attenuated control, less control than we might assume over quote unquote state owned enterprise. Well first, part of this just comes out of agency theory. Ownership does not necessarily mean control. So while the state has potential to control state owned enterprises, um, does it actually exercise that? And if I can just go back to this chart for a minute, how likely is it that a group of bureaucrats in Beijing, in SASAC, is actually controlling a corporate empire of this magnitude, probably not, probably not very likely. A massive span of control problem in this, uh, uh, in this structure. A couple of other pieces of evidence which um, admittedly are, are suggestive. SOEs have historically paid very low dividends to the state. Theoretically, the state and the Chinese people are the owner, quote unquote, of this enterprise. You would expect dividends to be paid. Uh, historically, they paid no dividends, and even though dividends are, being, uh, are increasing in recent years, they still pay a relatively low dividends uh, to the government. Another suggestive piece of evidence, if you look at executive compensation, we know from comparative corporate governance literature that executive compensation in controlling shareholder regimes looks different 
uh, and it's lower in its amounts than it is in dispersed ownership regimes, we would expect that to be true in China as well, if the state is acting as a controlling shareholder. In fact, while the state does try to regulate and does regulate formal amounts of compensation in this SOE network, in reality there are massive off books, if you will, forms of corporate, forms of compensation in the system, suggesting that the state actually is exercising less control than meets the eye. And finally, the government in China really seldom acts as a controlling show. That is, through the board of directors, when it seeks to change behavior in the SOE. Again, we would expect the controlling shareholder to exercise its powers as a shareholder if it sought to change behavior in the firm. We tend not to see that. We tend to see uh, the government acting as a regulator rather than uh, as a shareholder. And in fact, we have some examples in the paper of SOEs actually just flouting uh, government policy, just not doing what they are told uh, by the Chinese government. Seems inconsistent with the idea of direct control, top-down control from the government. Now the other side of this picture is that the state actually exercised extensive control over private firms uh, in, in China. When we think of a state-owned enterprise, what are the characteristics we would typically think of? We would, tick a, we would think of politically connected uh, managers of the firm. We would think of receipt of, of government subsidies. Uh, and we would think of sort of extra legal forms of control. We would think that the firm would be following industrial policy of, of the state. Actually, if you look closely, closely at private firms, and now when I, when I talk about private firms in China, I'm talking now about the largest, most successful firms. I'm not talking about smaller, uh, smaller enterprises. We find exactly those characteristics in, uh, in private firms. So we find politically connected entrepreneurs in China. We actually looked at the backgrounds of the um, either founder or controlling shareholder of the 100 largest private firms in China. And what we find is that 95 out of 100 of them have extensive connections to the party and to the government in China. So here's a list of the top 10. Nine of the top 10 have these connections. Interestingly, the only one that does not have any formal connections is Mr. Ren of Huawei. Huawei is a second company that was investigated by the House uh, as, under suspicion of being connected to the Chinese military. So it's sort of interesting and maybe ironic or not ironic uh, that Mr. Ren shows no formal connections to, uh, to the Chinese government or, or military. And again, we find in 95 out of 100, just looking at publicly available information, uh, we see these kind of connections. We also find massive state subsidies to the private sector. So here's a list of the top 10 recipients, private recipients of state subsidies uh, in China in 2010. And we see, for example, Geely Automobile, major private, private, quote unquote, automobile manufacturer, half of its net profits for the year came from government subsidies. Okay? Um, again, suggestive evidence, but I think it's, it, it kind of uh, demonstrates a, a, a sort of a, a picture. Also in terms of informal um, influence, what we find is that many private firms in China are members of trade associations or chambers of commerce, which in China are really a kind of shadow government regulatory organization. There really are no true private organizations in China. The party is, is there, regulators are there, many state-owned actors are there. And so it's a way uh, of, of transmitting <coughs> government policy to these actors. And the paper has several examples of informal uh, control or persuasion over uh, private, uh, private enterprises. So the point of this is not to suggest that there's no innovative firms in China, uh, not, not, not at all, but to suggest that one of the key ways of succeeding in China, regardless of ownership, whether you're an SOE or a POE, is to be close to the government, close to the party, and to derive significant rents from the party in the form of monopoly privileges or licenses uh, and, uh, and the like. Okay. Let me turn the last part of the presentation to some of the legal and policy institutions. And I want to emphasize, you know, the point of all this research is not that Chinese firms are bad or that they're good. It's simply to try to understand what their, what their unique characteristics are uh, and then to think about the policy issues that, are, um, that, that, this gives, uh, that this gives rise to. So very briefly, let me talk about some policy implications for current Chinese state sector reform. And let me talk about uh, some implications for, uh, for U.S. law. So let me start with China. As I mentioned earlier, um, China's current strategy, and the, the um, uh, President Xi regime has made state sector reform one of its top priorities. What is the strategy? 
mixed ownership, that is injecting more private capital into the state sector in the hopes of uh, improving market discipline and improving, uh, improving management. This is not a new strategy. In fact, this has been China's strategy from the outset of its economic reform. Partial privatization rather than uh, wholesale privatization. So it's not a new strategy. Um, and in fact, coupled with injection of more private capital is retaining and strengthening party oversight over uh, firms that are deemed to be strategic or, or pill. That is of crucial importance to the Chinese, uh, to the Chinese economy. If you, if you buy or if you're persuaded by the analysis that I've just given you, then this ref we can't expect very much from this reform. First of all, it's not new, and if it hasn't worked before, then doubling down on the strategy is not likely to have a big payoff this time. But more importantly, if it's, if it's right that it's the institutional environment that is really setting the incentive structure for firm, such that being close to the state and being close to the party is the key or one of the keys to success, changing ownership isn't going to change very much in the Chinese, uh, in the Chinese system because it's not about ownership. Ownership isn't where the action is in a Chinese firm. That is equity, equity ownership. What would be important is reforming the institutional structure, getting the party out of uh, corporate enterprises, having neutral enforcement of the law, actually enforcing the antitrust law and the like, cutting down on the, the monopoly privileges of favored firms. These things would change the environment. Tinkering with ownership, at least, again, if you're persuaded by our argument, uh, is, is not is not the answer for what ails uh, Chinese, the state, the state sector in China. Let me turn now to US law, and I think there's a whole range. I'm going to give just a couple of examples of how these distinctive features of Chinese firms are raising really kind of thorny issues uh, in, in the US legal system. So here's an example of a straightforward corporate law question, and, and also jurisdictional question, that arises from Chinese economic activity in the United States. It's based on ongoing litigation in the US. Actually, I'm involved in this case as an expert, but the, all the facts are in the public record. There's nothing controversial at all about the facts and the legal, the legal question. So some of you may know there's a, a big litigation uh, in the United States over uh, drywall. This is a building material that was supplied by Chinese manufacturers into the United States. Okay? It was put up in thousands of homes. The problem is, at least allegedly, it contains a very high level of sulfur. And so this sulfur has corroded, again, allegedly, it's corroded the appliances and the plumbing in these homes, and it's made people sick. So there are thousands of lawsuits pending against this company down at the bottom, Taishan Gypsum, which indisputably distributed this product into the United States. So there's no question that a US court has jurisdiction over this company at the bottom, OK? The question is, could a US court exercise jurisdiction over this entire corporate group? So this is a typical state-owned group with SASAC at the top, OK? China Building Materials Group is the, what I've called the core company. It has two listed subsidiaries, one Hong Kong, one Shenzhen. It has a massive number of downstream subsidiaries, including the US subsidiary. Can, can a US court take account of all of the contacts of this group with the United States to exercise personal jurisdiction over the entire group. If you go up to the group level, to the parent level, there are significant contacts with the United States, but not in the rest of the group. If the answer is yes, if it's yes, and that case is actually pending uh, currently, that question is pending before the Eastern District of Louisiana, even if the answer is yes, can you treat this as a single business enterprise such that liability can be attributed to the entire group and the assets of the entire group can be seized to make good on the judgment? So if you look just at the corporate structure, just what I've shown you here, under US law, the answer is well, probably not, probably not. We see you know, boards of directors, and we see resolutions, and we see minority shareholders, ownership, et cetera. Probably you wouldn't be inclined not to pierce. What if you take account of the party structure, and you take account of the fact that SASAC has the power to appoint and remove executives going down the line? But if you take account of the fact that SASAC has the power to drop down into any of these subsidiaries and supervise um, their, um, their actions, and in effect bypass, according to the law that governs SASAC, bypass the board of directors with respect to key decisions, 
If you take account of that, does it change the analysis? Well, we'll, we'll see what the, court, what the court says, but that's a good example of kind of conundrum or, or issue that's, that, that is, arises by virtue of these unique, uh, these unique features. Um, antitrust. Um, there are two cases uh, in, actually several cases now in the U.S. courts involving um, antitrust claims against Chinese defendants, state-owned Chinese defendants, or private um, defendants in some cases, and they're raising a sovereign compulsion defense. The Chinese government told us to engage in this anti-competitive behavior, okay? And that is a valid, sovereign compulsion is a valid defense in the U.S. antitrust law. The cases have come out differently. In the vitamin C uh, price fixing case, um, actually the, the Chinese government intervened as an amicus and said, we, f we force the defendants to take this conduct. We force them to fix prices. You shouldn't hold them liable. District Court in New York said, we don't buy that. We don't see any formal law that says that the Chinese government has the power to compel this. What the court didn't take account of is the fact that all of these firms are part of a trade association, which as I said earlier, acts as a kind of shadow government regulator. I, I'm not arguing with whether this is rightly or wrongly decided, but again, it's an example of the unique characteristics of these firms. In a second case, a Pennsylvania district court involving uh, alleged conspiracy to limit the supply of bauxite into the United States, the court did accept the sovereign compulsion defense that, in fact, by virtue of their membership in this trade association, the other informal influence of the Chinese government, this activity actually was compelled by the government. Um, another very straightforward example, merger analysis. When a Chinese state-owned enterprise, enterprise makes an acquisition, what is the relevant unit of analysis for, th for thinking about the impact on the market? Do we only look at the actual acquirer? Do we look at the entire Chinese corporate group? Do we look at every group in a similar industry that's ultimately owned by, by SASAC? Um, the European Commission has actually faced this question in two merger cases. Um, what they said was, the only way we can answer this question is by diving deeply into the, the corporate structure to actually think about who exercises control and how it's controlled. We can't stop at equity ownership. So this is a good example of exactly what we think in our paper has to be done. You can't stop at ownership. You have to look at actual control. Now, fortunately for the European Commission, in both of these cases, having said we have to do this analysis, they said, well, actually, we don't have to do the analysis in this case because even if we took the broadest unit possible, the market impact wouldn't be sufficient uh, to trigger our, um, uh, our, our regime, uh, uh, our antitrust regime. But that's an example, I think, of the kind of analysis that is required when dealing with, uh, with Chinese, uh, Chinese firms. Last example, and I'll, I'll go quickly through this, national security screening. So um, the United States, and I'll, I'll basically skip the detail here, but the United States, like many countries, has a national security screening process for acquisitions of control by a foreign entity of a U.S. corporation. And this process has been delegated to a committee called CFIUS, kind of odious sounding name, um, but it's a, it's a high level committee comprised of the Treasury Department, State, Commerce, Homeland Security, et cetera. And um, they screen the, the potential acquisition. Um, and if they want more information, they trigger an, uh, an additional investigation, which usually results in the foreign buyer disappearing because it's become too politically um, sensitive. But you see down in the middle here, uh, there's an automatic triggering of this 45-day investigation for quote unquote foreign government controlled transactions. It obviously raises the question, what exactly does, what is for a foreign government controlled uh, transaction? Now China uh, in recent years has been the home country of the largest number of covered transactions under the US sec uh, uh, national security screening regime with the UK or Japan second. So many cases have resulted in uh, investigations uh, by, uh, by CFIUS. Um, I'm going to skip the CFIUS in, in, in action. Um, what we argue in, the, in one of the papers, or several of the papers, is that because of these distinctive characteristics of Chinese firms, and because of the, the skepticism or the suspicion that every firm is ultimately linked to the Chinese government and to the party, I argue there is a kind of suspicion tax that is borne by all globally active Chinese companies. And it would be in their interest, actually, to be more transparent about their ownership, to clarify or to curtail links with the party that actually they would, they would benefit in their global activity by doing that. Um, 
I don't know whether that's happening yet, but here's a good illustration, a current illustration of the suspicion tax. So a current uh, proposed acquisition of the Chicago Stock Exchange by a company called Chongqing Kasin Enterprise Group. Okay? Chicago Stock Exchange is obviously a very important asset. It's part of the so-called critical infrastructure of the United States, which is one of the covered transactions for the national security regime. Um, and CCEG is a very typical company of the sort that I've just described. It was formed out of formerly state-owned uh, uh, assets. It's active in areas that the government considers sensitive. And the chairman of this firm is a member of an industry group led by the mayor of Chongqing. So it bears the hallmarks of a Chinese corporation. Is it a, is it a state-owned enterprise? Well, not really. Is it a private enterprise? Well, not really. It's, it's hard to say. It's, it's, it's really hard to categorize. So here's a letter that was recently written by 45 Republican senators to the Treasury Department, which has a big role in this screening process. The American market has little information about the acquirer, and it shares many of the traditional opaque qualities of a Chinese company. Should you determine that the acquirer maintains a close rela <coughs> relationship with the government, and therefore the military, and notice the way that the senators have conflated the government with the military, we would urge CFIUS to deny this transaction. So again, it's an illustration of the type of conundrum that's raised by distinctive characteristics of these firms, and the suspicion tax that all of them bear in their global uh, activity. So just to wrap up, uh, you know, state capitalism is dead, long live state capitalism. So SOEs have been around for a long time. People thought they were dead after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Well, they've come back in a big way, particularly with the rise of, uh, of China. That's not the only place where they're active, Brazil and India, et cetera, they're still active. So state capitalism where SOEs are dead, uh, but long live uh, SOEs. Um, I think there's many very important policy issues raised by these firms. Um, again, not suggesting that the Chinese firms are good or bad. It's simply to highlight this tension that many of these regimes simply don't contemplate large, globally active economic actors of, of the sort um, that Chinese firms are today. So there's a tension there. How will it be resolved? Will Chinese firms change, or will these regimes um, have to change to, to accommodate them? Thank you very much.